James in the New Testament. James chapter 4. I'll be reading verses 1 to 12. You can find it on page 1215 if you need a page number. So James chapter 4, reading from verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit that is caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your word that challenges us. Father, please speak your word into our hearts. Lord, anoint and equip me to speak, that I might speak your word in truth and touch the hearts of all of us that we might receive from you, not the words of man, but your holy, wonderful word, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this chapter begins with the words, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Verse 1. So there were clearly some problems within the church. Some, the Christians that James was writing to all those years ago were falling out with one another. They were quarreling. And as we enter, to ver enter verse 11, Sir James comes to an expression of that disunity. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. So there's, there's a major problem within that church. They're disunited and argumentative. We don't know what they were arguing about, but in many ways it doesn't matter because we will all hold different opinions about various matters. But if we really are God's people, then we should be able to hold those different, those different opinions in tension. All disagreements should be dealt with in love. Remember the words of Peter? Love covers over a multitude of sins. James begins in verse 11 addressing the believers he's writing to. And he addresses them as brothers and sisters. Now think who James is. He's the great apostle. He's the earthly brother of Jesus. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. But he doesn't command them. He draws alongside them humbly. He appeals to them on their level. He binds himself to them in love. And this is how we should handle our disagreements. 
So often people come into a disagreement with a superior attitude, discounting the opinion of others, putting them down in their attitude and in their manner of speaking. But if we were to approach one another in love as brothers and sisters in Christ, acknowledging him as Lord in our midst, no disagreement would ever degenerate into an argument. If we could see Jesus in the midst of us, then we would handle things in love, looking to him. There would be no quarrels, no black no backbiting, no slander, because Jesus is with us. Even though we do not see him physically, nevertheless, Jesus is present. As he promised to us in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered or come together in my name, there am I with them. And as God's people, when we come together anywhere, we automatically come together in Jesus' name. And even though we can't see him, he's always there. He is Lord and God. His loving eyes are on us. If we realize that, then all Christians would behave differently. So brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. The word for slander means to speak against, to speak ill of. Now our word slander has the connotation of falsehood, of telling lies about someone, because that's what slander is. It's something that's untrue. But the Greek here means to speak against. So that includes both lies and the truth. Do not speak against one another, whether it's the truth or a falsehood. So if you have a problem, take it to the person, pri- to the person privately, as Jesus commands us in the same, that same passage from Matthew 18, where he says, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. So take it to them privately but do it in love. If we can't love one another as brothers and sisters, those who have been saved from sin, those who have been pardoned by God, forgiven, washed in the blood of Jesus, adopted by the the Father, born of the Holy Spirit, if we can't love one another as brothers and sisters, there's something very wrong. We need to get down on our knees and beg God's help and forgiveness. Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. Verse 11. So what does James mean when he says, if we speak against one another, we judge the law of God? Well, he's referring us to Leviticus 19. And whilst many people roll their eyes whenever Leviticus is quoted, this is a verse that's quoted by Jesus on a number of occasions. And that verse from Leviticus reads, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. And wherever God adds the words, I am the Lord, to a command, he's adding extra weight, extra importance to the command. And and remember that that Jesus said when asked, which is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, the entire Old Testament, hang on these two commandments. These two commands, to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves, 
are the most important commands of God, and that comes straight from the lips of Jesus. And in fact, John warns us in his first letter that anyone who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Love is at the heart of genuine Christianity. But we can only truly love because God first loved us. And in 1 John 4, John warns us, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus said that eternal life is knowing God personally. To have eternal life is to know God. And to know God is to love. To love him and other people, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we do not love, then we do not know God. And we do not have life eternal. If we do not love, we're still dead in our transgressions and sins. For love is the evidence, the litmus test of true Christianity. Paul writes that we were each dead in our transgressions and sin in which we used to live, Ephesians 2. We were spiritually dead, cut off from God, the source of life, because of our sins the fact that we're not perfect. And that is the beginning, the starting point for each and every one of us, for all humanity, dead in our sins and transgressions. But God, in love, gave Jesus for us. Jesus, God himself, the second person of the Godhead. And Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins on the cross. In love for us, he bore it all. Every sin, everything about us that is less than perfect, Jesus died for your sins and mine on the cross. His sacrifice is for you. And he calls us to repent, to turn away from sin, all that is wrong in our lives, and to invite him to be Lord over us and Saviour. Jesus died for you. So if you haven't already, call on his name and he will forgive. Jesus died on the cross, was buried, but on Easter Sunday was raised to life. Without Jesus, we were objects of God's wrath. But the moment that we first believe and this is Ephesians 2. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace, by God's loving kindness, that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. The moment that we first believe, we are raised with Christ. At that moment, we have life eternal. At that moment, we know God personally. We're born again of the Holy Spirit. We're filled and forgiven. And the Holy Spirit begins a work of transformation within us. And the first evidence of the reality of our conversion of this presence of the Spirit within us is that we begin to love God and love our brothers and sisters in Christ who also share in His Spirit. And this is why John says, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. We only love because He first loved us and we have experienced that love. 
And this is why I said that love is the litmus test, the indicator, the evidence of true Christianity. Now, if any of us fails the test, then we need to get down on our knees and repent. Turn to Jesus and call on his name. And in his mercy, he will forgive. He will save us from ourselves. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It is by our love that we will be known as Jesus' disciples, his true disciple. And if we love, then we won't slander, we won't speak against our brothers and sisters. If we love, that love will be evidenced in what we say, both to and about one another. James is quite blunt about this, because he says in, ver in verse 11, Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Well, the law says, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19. And if we're speaking against slandering or finding our brothers and sisters wanting, if we're judging them, then we're not keeping the law. In fact, by being so cavalier, we're rejecting it. Because in fact, we're setting ourselves up as judge and jury, both against the person and against the law of God. And that is a dangerous thing to do because there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. If we judge the law, then we're usurping God's position. We're making ourselves the judges when judgment is God's prerogative. And when we do this, and I'm sure we'll all do this at some point, then we need to repent and seek his forgiveness. My dear friends, we must take this call to love, to build one another up seriously. If we can ignore this command without conviction, can we truly be saved? Let us love as Jesus calls us to, to love one another like Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. And this is where I turn to Romans 12, to the blessing in the service book that I use at communion. Let your love be genuine. Let your love be real. Be devoted to one another in brotherly affection. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, so let us recognize Christ in one another and love. Put that, that love into practical action. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. We're to love one another, to care for one another to bear with one another, to be interested, to be concerned for one another's welfare, support one another, pray for one another. And as Paul continues, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If we truly love, then we will work for peace peace in every situation and especially within the family of God's people. If we love, 
then our speech will be full of love. We will not slander or speak against one another. We will not criticize one another harshly. We'll not spit at one another like angry cats. Rather, in love, we will encourage, we will bear with and allow others to hold a different opinion. And in love, we will use our tongues to build one another up, just as Jesus commands us to. So, my dear friends, let your love be genuine. Let's pray. Father, we recognize before you that we are human, that we bear our flesh. And there are times, Lord, that when our love slips, forgive us those times. Grant us a new experience of your love, we pray. Grant us a stronger taste that we might love one another as you desire. Father, grant that we might live up to this call and not be found wanting. Father, let our love be genuine. In Jesus' name, amen.